Okay, people. What do we have this week? This week, it's Children of the Mind by Orson Scott Card. Pretty famous writer there. Um, I'm just going to go right to my rating to start. Just so you'll sort of know where you stand. I gave this a 2. I gave this a 2 out of 5. It... The 2 is for effort. Okay, it tries. But I don't think it really sticks any of the landings. Okay. This is... What is this? It's like the 4th... Of like seven, eight Ender books. If you read Ender's Game back in the day, or at any time, this is part of the series of those books. I did read Ender's Game, so I had some idea. But I'm not going to lie, re reading this one, when all this in your head is Ender's Game... Is like watching the first Fast and Furious and then coming back for like Fast and Furious 6, where they're like fighting on the moon or something. You know, you know how crazy it got. There's this big change in the environment here in this book. But that's not what kills this book. Okay, so I do know I have some understanding of the characters, of the world we're dealing with. But I'm going to try and go as if you didn't. Even if you didn't. It explains enough of the back. Of the back end. For, to catch you up. So if you never read Ender's Game. You just grab this one. You're going to get a 2 out of 5. If you did. If you love Ender's Game. If you're all about the Enderverse. You're going to read this one anyway. Right? You're still going to get a 2 out of 5. You're just going to enjoy it more than most people. Because you're invested. With or without a, that investment, th this book isn't that good. <sighs> and I know I'm not reading them in order, right? I know, like, let's say, if I read the other three books, maybe this one would be better. It wouldn't. But this is something I'm doing on purpose. I get into a habit where I only want to read like, like normally back in the day, I'd see Enderverse and I'd be like, well, I need to get all seven of these books and then start reading and then get through half of the second book and go, this sucks. And then have like five more books that I don't want or care about. I'm trying to not do that. So I'm going to read, I will read, I will be reading books out of order. The ones that I have, the ones that I own. But this, this is one of those that's going to be not in order and how I deal with that. All right, so the book starts and we're, um, we have a Si Wang Mu sitting on some kind of a table in some kind of a small room and she's sort of piecing out, you know, she's deducing as they say. She's deducing that it's a spaceship of some sort. Somehow. And we also get the sense that she's not very modernized. Right? That she grew up somewhere where she's not stupid. But she is ignorant of things. Right? We get that sense out of her very quickly. Now here's something... That, that happens. You don't notice at first. You don't notice till about halfway through the book, if I'm being honest. Is we'll, we'll get characters one way and the narration follows that way. And the character building follows that. So this naive Si Wang Mu at some point in this book just flips around and she's like some with its city girl, kind of, right? So it's like halfway through, 
Our boy Orson Scott Card got more interested in the argument he's trying to have between his characters than remembering their sort of traits, if that makes sense. It happens throughout the book. It, it happens to Si Wang Mu. It happens to Jane, the AI, where at one point she's one way and then she just flips it. And she's a different way. Very inconsistent in that. Um, we meet a Peter Wiggin. If I remember right, he's supposed to be Ender's brother. Right? And he's a bit of a douche. And here we get... We get one of the major concepts of the book. We start gnawing on it very early on. And I don't mind this concept. I give him credit for trying. I don't think he stuck the landing, but I give him credit for trying. Something happened. Something happened, and there was a disease that was going to kill everyone. I forget the name. I didn't write it down. Ender, uh, Miro, and someone else. I forget the other person. They go outside of reality or the dimension or something to this effect. Right? And when you're outside, that's what they say, you're with the Iuas. Iuas. Sort of like a soul or where the gods live, or something to this effect. There's some kind of nexus of energy. Of everyone's energy. Right? So, if you went out there, your idea, if you held it strongly enough, will manifest. I'm assuming they all went out with the idea of the molecule that saves them, but only one came back with that. Because... Ender went out and made two, I don't know what you want to say, what's the word, like mock-ups of himself, of, of, he brought to life two things. One was Peter Wiggin, uh, hold on. one was Peter Wiggin, or his, uh, that's how they explain it, they say he had an idea of his brother that was so strong in his mind that he manifested it into reality. He also had an idea of his sister, but not as she is, a younger version of his sister. And he manifested that into reality. And Miro, who was a crippled, in a wheelchair, all this and that, had in his mind his perfect body. And so he manifested that. Now then what happens... Miro, the crippled, sees Miro, the Adonis, and somehow just, I think they say because his desire was so strong to be one place and not in another, that he just leaves the old body, and it disintegrates into dust. The other person comes back with the cure, saves everyone. They did their job. Your boy Ender comes back with these two things what are they and they have a lot of existential conversations about what they are do some of them hit i i don't know on the one hand peter wiggin has all these memories but they're not real memories they're not actually peter wiggin and he's very vicious so we get the sense that ender puts some of his drive his viciousness into this right the way they describe it, these two, these three bodies are living off of one Iua, right? The one Iua, and apparently it has enough juice to fuel them all. The problem is interest. So if young Valentine is flying around the galaxy with Adonis Miro, and the, the Ender doesn't believe her life 
is important, is interesting, that's what they say, interesting, that she'll start to fade away. Clumps of hair will fall out. She'll just lay down and turn to dust. And the same goes any way you slice it. Right? Which is kind of... I'm like... I like the concept. I like the concept. But then he... The motivators for this concept. Because they'll have arguments like... Yes, your memories are Ender Wigan given. But you've since then made new memories. Right? So aren't you you of those memories? And they'll be like, well, the way I react to those memories is from him, so it's just him by proxy. So I'm not really real, I'm just a proxy. Right? Psh, I don't know. I'm trying to think if I'm looking at this, how would it how would it work? Because later, he has Hive Queens, where they have this sort of telepathy as well. And I get some sense that he got the idea of this from them, but theirs functions completely different. They all have a Hive Mind, where she can control all the workers. They sort of acquiesce to this, and she just sees through their eyes, through a thousand million different eyes all at once. And I'm like, he never explained why it would be different in Ender's case. Why wouldn't Ender's network work like the Hive Queen network? You see? He never explains this. He just settles on what he wants and then moves along. But it doesn't... Sh he doesn't sh if I'm looking in lore, right? If I live in the world of the book, I don't think it makes sense. Don't think that it makes sense. In any case, that's our setup. We have this triad of enders. That's how they're describing themselves. I would think at a certain point, even if I made an avatar of myself, if I'm not in direct connection to it, like the Hive Queens, if I'm not making memories or experiencing sensations off of their sensations real time, <clears throat> I don't think I can call that me. I think that those experiences start to make an individual. And he doesn't go into the strength of an individual and its individuality. He constantly ties them back to Ender. I don't think that they would tie. You see? So, but that's what he wants to do. He wants to have that type of philosophical discussion. And he's trying to use his book to move those discussions along. But he doesn't do a good job. He would have been better with maybe just like an essay. Just like a philosophical essay. Of if we could split our soul or Iua into three. What would that look like? You know. Kind of like Tolkien does with the appendices. Where he could just have three philosophers in world philosophizing about these issues. And it could just be 20 pages, 30, 30 pages long. Just tacked on to the end. Just an appendices of of, of the Enderverse. Have a, a discussion between a Earth philosopher and a Hive Queen. This kind of thing. Right? But he does it. So we have to judge him by what he did. When you bring up these issues, uh, I did another one. Nemesis, Asimov, I think. I have a video down there. He does the same thing. Where the point of the book almost isn't the story. It's this, it's this subject matter that the author wants to chew through. Now when you do that, you hide it. You hide it in your story. Otherwise, your reader is just reading an essay. That's interrupting a story. Which is what happens here. This is the problem. This is why it got such a low rating. He can't hide. The essayness of it. We, we have people. Conversations between people. Multiple times. Of just back and forth. Of just, of just philosophicalness. But it's not hidden at all. It's not. Pushing the character. It's not pushing the story. You just stop. 
babble than resume. Too herky jerky. It's too herky jerky. Another thing is people keep getting insulted by people's subconscious. So when Ender comes back and brings what they call young Val, because his sister Valentine's still alive, she's like offended somehow that he thought of this younger version of her rather than her as she is, and his wife's offended that he's not thinking of her in the subconscious and instead is thinking of a Peter Wiggin or, or something like this. People keep getting offended by half thoughts in other people's heads. And I'm like, that's that's kind of goofy. You can't control your subconscious, right? Now I think <laughs> I think he's thinking it in terms of uh, trying to be like a romantic writer where even in his subconscious he's thinking such and such. It just doesn't fly, it just doesn't make sense. It's a lizard brain, people. Your subconscious might just be thinking of food. My, mine's probably thinking of chili dogs right now. I just want to eat a pallet of them. Doesn't mean I'm going to eat a pallet of chili dogs. It's a subconscious lizard brain. But I swear they they do it like personal. I'm personally offended that your subconscious wasn't ta thinking about me when you were out in the outer dimension. And I'm like, that's irrational. You people are irrational. But it goes to our boy, our Orson Scott Card, his inability to write romance. Because what we end up here is with like a trio of romances. A romance between Miro, Young Val, and Jane the AI. A romance between Peter and Wang Mu. And a romance between Ender and Novenia, his wife. Now, they're all aged a little different, right? I don't think any of them are kids. Peter and Wang Mu are definitely on the young side. Let's say 19. We go with that. In any case, you could have gone with sort of a tier, right? Like, where if you imagine each of the three as Ender, this one's young Ender, this one's prime Ender, this one's old Ender, and you're telling me every love story he's had in his life, he's had, like, okay, a normal person would fall in, in and out of love throughout their life and then f finish off their life. You see what I'm saying? He could have used these three to tell all those stories at once. You see? He doesn't. Instead, he tries to have sort of like cheesy love story style with each of them. But it comes out of the blue. It's like you're eating something just normal and they just... And now all of a sudden, the next scoop is just cheese. And you're like, I was, in, I was eating mashed potatoes a second ago. Where's this cheese coming from? It's just a big glob of cheese and he just wants you to eat it. They're not good. The, the, the romance is not good. It doesn't build the way it needs to. It's not giving the room to breathe that it needs to have. And he needs it three in triplicate. He needs three of these love stories to work for you to care. And I'm talking like there's banter and then someone says something and they're like the other person's like deeply wounded by it. And I'm like, that wounding shot doesn't feel any different than any of the other shots that were being thrown around here. We went from a normal conversation to you're wounded. It doesn't make sense. Right? You, you gotta build a relationship between people. Somehow. That's what romance writers do. They, they're able to give you that energy of something between people without just, you know, laying it out for you. <clears throat> In any case, he doesn't. He could have, and he doesn't. Um, sort of our issues, what's supposed to be driving our story, is we have a fleet coming. They call it the Lusitania fleet. Where is it heading? To the planet Lusitania. So, you know, apropos 
name. The, con the Star Congress or whatever got word of this disease on this planet that kills every human, which they've now cured, but somehow they didn't tell Congress. So Congress is like, let's go nuclear, let's go molecular nuclear bomb the planet and completely destroy it so that there's no chance this thing can get back to us. And I'm like, that's a bit extreme. But that's what's happening. And they're in flight, so no one can stop them. Unless we can... Here's what they decide to do. One. Miro, Young Val, and Jane are using Jane's ability to take a ship outside and then back inside in a microsecond. Now, when you go outside and back in, you can go in anywhere you want. So it's instantaneous travel. No time dilation. No waiting through space for years. So they could just, they're zipping around. And what they're doing is finding colonies, habitable worlds, so that we can send hive queens. There's hive queens, there's trees that hang out with piggies. I'm like, I don't know, they're talking trees. And people. They're trying to get as many people colonized in other places from this planet before it blows up. I'm like, that's smart. What I don't understand is why Jane didn't just send out 15,000 probes. Right? You could just... And then... And you just... You could scan a planet. Right? You can, you can go down to a planet and say, sensors say no oxygen, not going to work. I don't know why we didn't do this. Apparently we need to have Miro and Jane looking at readouts. <sighs> so that's what they do. On the other side is Peter and Wang Mu, who are supposedly trying to pair up and talk their way through the shady underworld of the Congress to see who's the real power behind the throne to get them to change their mind about blowing up a planet. It sounds convoluted. And he doesn't, he doesn't land this storyline really either. We make two stops, and the second stop is the end. And by the second stop, we've already basically dropped all the espionage-ness we were doing. It's kind of goofy. In any case, they end up succeeding. Congress has changed their mind, not through any of their efforts, but through money. And I'm like, if money could have done it, you show me... Every, okay, every time they go to a new planet, Jane is like filling up their backstory and giving them money right so you have credits to spend you have an apartment that looks like you've been there for years wait why couldn't jane just throw money around at congressmen and get them to change their mind everyone talks through uh you know video call anyway she could just pretend to be someone else on the video call she's an ai computer and convince them that that's not the right thing and then load them with credits why didn't we just do that we'd have averted the whole thing but we don't. So they eventually stop it. They eventually succeed. The Congress changes their mind. But the admiral in charge of the fleet's like, I'm going to blow it up anyway. And then they end up just like grabbing the missile out of space, putting it back in the ship and having like a conversation while they dearm it. It's kind of silly. And I'm like, you could have just waited till then. Or you could have teleported someone in sooner to have the discussion and stop it from getting launched. I don't know. It's, it's inconsistencies, right? These are inconsistencies. The other problem we have, our horrible deadline, is they voted. They, they are aware of Jane, but they don't know she's an AI. So they think she's like a virus, so they voted to shut it all down and disconnect the network of all these computers where she lives. And then she was essentially going to die. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, she has faster than light travel. Grab someone from here, teleport them over there and say, I have faster than light travel if, there, if, if we keep this artificial intelligence alive. So don't turn off the computers. You could have just said that. They don't. Instead we wait till it it all go okay. 
It all goes south. They shut the computers down. She half dies. She ends up living in... All right, hold up. That's what's going to happen. They were like, if we have a, if we have a body for her to live in, maybe she could live in that and not have to die. Well, Ender has three bodies. He doesn't need one of them. And I'm like, well, F the people who were there, right? Because they don't have thoughts. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to argue to me that their individual thoughts don't count. They just have to want to give up the body from the deepest liver uh, lizard brain that they have. So, Ender just gets tired of that life, right? That's what they say. The other two are leading more interesting lives, so his spirit is leaving this one. It dies, turns to dust. Now we're down to two bodies. Miro pretends to hate young Val so that her, her altruistic self can be self-sacrificing. And so then Ender can then pour all the way into Peter. And then Jane floods into Val's body, and then now she has a body. But it's not big enough to hold her Iowa, so she's using it, as well as a ne the network of trees that tele telepathically talk to the Hive Queen. And between these entities, the trees and Jane's body, I mean uh, Val's body, she can then live. And I'm like, sounds like it should work problem a why didn't we just get jane a hive queen body to live in right now you could say those hive queens don't want to give up their hive queenness i'm like fine they can just birth a new hive queen give it to jane you know before we implant all of our ancestral memories into the new one give it to jane their culture is fine with this they even say at some point, not all the workers consent sort of to being, then they have to sort of be killed or overpowered, right? So they have a culture that supersedes individuality for the immortality that the hive queens have. And they have this by the ability to pass on memories telepathically to the new. So all the Hive Queens all share their memories. And before they die, they pass on those memories to all the other Hive Queens. I'm like, just have a Hive Queen that's blank. Give it Jane's memories. And then she'll have a million workers to also share her computing power with. Right? And she could have, if she's too big for a Hive Queen, she could have used the trees like she did with young Val's body anyway. Right? We don't do this for reasons. I don't know what those reasons are. Make perfect sense to me. And then on the flip side, they don't, they, 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 okay. Ender's memories when he dies don't go with him to the new Peter, but they kind of do. That's what he says. Just like young Val's memories are still there. She remembers conversations. She knows how to move her hands. This kind of thing. Right? Because she learned those things. Those memories stayed with Jane. But young Val's not there. And I'm like, I guess you can say that. Except, cut to Miro. Same thing happened to Miro. There was two Miros. And when this one saw this one, it just left. And then this one, there was nothing left of it. So it just disintegrated. Right? So why, if the memories, if Miro memories went from old Miro to new Miro, why didn't the same thing happen with this? Young Val should not have any of Young Val's memories. Ender memories, Val memories should all go into Peter, the new Ender. Right? And he should have all those memories. We don't do this. And I, it's not explained why. Well, in his... I think what he wanted is a more pleasant love story ending, right? Instead of two people just disintegrating and everyone living in New Peter. I guess that's just what he wanted. And if I think about it, I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine for the same reason that he left Miro, 
that Miro's old self left for the new one. I think once Ender is seeing his mortality, his, his will to live would drive him into the younger Peter's body, irrespective of what anyone else thinks. Will to live is very strong. Our Orson Scott card thinks will to live is just words, right? Like, if I tell you, you know, you're not needed anymore, it's you can just pass on or something. That's not how that crap works. You can, you can say it to your blue in the face. It's what's inside that person. It's, it's the drive, right? But I think it would have been more interesting to have Jane in a hive queen, right? I, personally, it would have been more interesting. You wouldn't have had the love stories, but you'd have had this interaction with a hive queen in a different state than you do other hive queens. <sighs> That's not what we do. In the end, Jane is turned off. She survives only in Young Val and this network of trees. I don't know. I don't care about ants, and I love Lord of the Rings, so I'm not going to care about these trees a bunch either. It just is what it is. Trees are boring. But I'm not, it's not why it got a two. It's these other reasons. So don't think I'll just be biased and then kill a rating on that. I'm not. They end up shutting all the computers down. Jane is living in these trees. When they turn them back on, she had a few spots where her, her people loyal to her would bank up a lot of computers and save what she asked them to save. So she, had, she starts retaining some modicum of processing power. But between that, young Val, and the trees, she's able to process enough information to move people outside and back in. And so we retain faster than light travel. We then go to the ship, the Lusitania fleet, and tell them all this. And like, here's a good reason to undo these blocks. And I'm like, bro. You could have stopped all of this before it happened by sending someone from Okay, you grab someone from Lusitania, Ender, or Peter Wigan, or I don't care who, the mayor, anybody that there's no... And you take them to the fleet, right to the fleet, and you're like, how'd you catch up with us? Boy, we have faster than light travel. If you, you know, I can pluck you out of here and move you back to Earth, you won't lose all the years with your family. They'd have agreed to that crap. Then that's proof. Look, here's your admiral. Here's proof that I can move things faster than light. But if you shut down the computers, I can't. Faster than light travel would supersede any concerns they have about this AI. Period. End of discussion. If I can get myself from one planet to the next instantly. If I can move goods, colonize, all the good things that come with faster than light travel, that supersedes everything. The Star Congress would have started adding processing. We're like, every planet needs to have massive supercomputers to make it easier on this AI. You know? Now, eventually, let's be honest, that'd lead to the full-on AI wars that we all know are coming. But that's not in this book. It's just made up in my head. So that's what ends up happening. Miro ends up with Jane, who he kind of loved because he was always there for him. Even though he said he loved Val. Apparently he just liked the body. Which is kind of creepy. They bring up these these questions a lot. Like you know. What where, what are you in love with? The body. Or the mind. I'm like, If it's love it should be the mind. But he's just like. Well I'll take the body and the, this mind. He's like a Frankenstein love monster. It's kind of not right. I don't, I don't agree with that. And and this is how how the book ends. I can tell he doesn't want Ender to die. Right? He likes the character. But the story demands what the story demands. And so he tried to, to like backdoor it. Right? Here's a way I can keep Ender alive with it not being Ender, but it's Ender. Right? So I'm trying to feed the story, but also trying to not lose my character. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work for all these loopholes that shouldn't exist. Right? I don't mind the philosophy of it, though. I don't mind the conversations we have in it. 
I just wish we would have had a more interesting way to get about these. Because there are like four or five of these that just force themselves into our our story for what it is, even though it's weak and doesn't hold up to anything. And then we just read page after page of this conversation, and then we cut to another conversation. That's what we're doing. And then we're done. So we could have had more story. I'm still more interested in the world he's built. The philosophy itself doesn't hold up to its own scrutiny. There are, there are massive holes in the book, which shouldn't be there. And then you, you're done. Ender dies. Ender lives. And then I'm like, well, what happens when the, the, the vow body dies in like 70 years? We're all going to lose the, the ability to instantaneously travel? Or will she just give up having a life? Or do we just... Do we make her a clone body that doesn't have a, a, a brain, a soul, so she can just flood it? I think that's what I'd do. Clone bodies with no memories. That when this one dies... She can just grab another one. And they're going to be on every planet so that we have redundancies. And every planet we find and every starship we find will have as much computing power as we can shove on it for Jane to use to move us around. Yeah, that's what I'd have. No lie. All right, people. Ad time. Uh, go buy my books. I gotta say, my books are better than this book. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. My books are better than this one. No offense, Orson Scott Card. Not a great book. You can skip it. Is that enough? Is this enough time for ads? Yeah, I mean, I told you to buy. Um. No, this one went well. I mean, it's an easy read. It doesn't take long. I'm, I'm going to use the free time I have to read some of these fat boys. And everything's going on schedule right now. So, all is looking good. Thank you all for tuning in. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>